Okay, so thanks very much for joining me this week, everyone. I am so excited. I have an amazing guest with me today, and I cannot wait to introduce her. This woman was one of my inspirations in dowsing, and I had the privilege to meet her at the British Society of Dowsers. And the work she has done with dowsing to help people is absolutely mind blowing. Um, and she's a published author, so do get her book, which we will talk about at the end. Um, but welcome, Elizabeth Brown. It's so nice to see you. Thank you. That is just lovely. Thank you. I'm not sure I deserve it, but I am grateful. <laughs> yes, you do. Yes, you do. Your work has been absolutely incredible. And um, yeah, I'm delighted to have you here. Oh, so good. do you want to tell us just a little bit about how you got into dowsing? What drew you into this world of the uh, esoteric Oh, I'm I'm sure it was all fate. I I um the first time I ever heard of, uh, held a pair of dowsing rods was forty years ago, and in a one Sunday afternoon on a dusty lane in in Kent, and um, the son of a miner handed handed me a pair of dowsing rods and say, "Have you ever heard of these? Have a look." Handed them to me, and they went whizzing round in my hands. I, but I mean, I, I swear my eyes bulged and I said, what, what, but what does that mean? What does it all mean? And well, they didn't really know. And they said, he said, my father used it down the mines when the coal mines in Kent, when they worked. And um, that was it. And then it was years, I think it's about five years later. So the universe was quite insistent. Um, a client of mine when I was working in New York um, was was that was at was a dowser at his house in um, in uh, Virginia, and uh, he he taught me to douse in one night um, with a <laughs> finding things which I'm actually no good at now. But um, then he gave me two pairs of dowsing rods, two books, and then and then sent me on my way. And then when I came back to live in England, I joined the British Society of Dowsers. It was it sort of all unfolded naturally. But I have to say, I've been doing strange things since I was about three years old. I used to play with spirit children, and my first teacher came along when I was when I was fourteen, and they taught me all sorts of things like psychometry and reading ob ob reading objects and hypnosis and all sorts of very interesting things. So that really set me on my way. But it was it was really an unfolding journey. And then after I think ten years being an an amateur dowser, I then um, set up with a colleague. I set up a geopathic stress consultancy and started professionally so I had 10 years grounding before I before I did that I honestly didn't really have the confidence it's a bit you probably know it's a big leap when you go from amateur to professional because you're taking on so much responsibility so so that was the the dowsing bit of it yeah, I think you're right. It's a, it's a huge, uh, it is a huge leap to go from amateur to pro professional. I think there's a lot of parallels, actually, listening to you talk about how you started, because I started dowsing very young. I started dowsing as a nine year old when we moved to Ireland. Uh, oh, wow. We had no water and someone said, well, you've got an acre of land, you can probably put a borehole in. So we went and fetched this Irish dowser who just cut the hazel wire rods out the hedge. I went walking all over the land and he said to us kids, do you want to have a go? And of course, I held the wire rods and they just really, really bent really sharply. And he taught me how to water dowse. And it was something that sat there in the back. But like you, I was also psychic. I, I can see energy and I had spirit guides and my teachers were nature spirits. So it's kind of like I think in almost like this tool, this mechanism gets yes. presented to you as a yes. way of having these sort of conversations with other aspects of reality that we can't normally get to in our conscious mind. And I think that's the thing that fascinates me is that, that dowsing is this opportunity because anybody with the right coaching normally has some kind of dowsing ability. Would you agree that's true? Absolutely, totally agree. It, it, it's not some mysterious gift, a gift. Well, it is given by God, I suppose, if you look at it that way, but it's not a mysterious gift given to the selected few, it's a natural ability because 
at, at ground state level, at base level, we're a bundle of energy and a bundle of consciousness and consciousness communicates with other consciousness and dowsing is just a way of doing that one way of doing that yeah because dowsing is you know we we can't actually speak to a tree with our conscious mind because a tree doesn't have language it can't answer us back the only way we can communicate is with energy and i think you know the pendulum is so great that we can ask um you know as we'll talk about carefully framed questions to get that's the difficult bit for everybody, isn't it? But to get a yes or no answer. But that means that we can access any information about anything, anywhere and any when. And that is just to me, that's absolutely mind blowing. That is the ultimate power, isn't it? To have all the answers to your questions. I'd, I'd probably add a couple of caveats to that, because, you know, if you if you want to know um the color of Rishi Sunak's underpants, you're probably not going to be, you're probably well, going to be denied that. Questions, yeah. <laughs> so I, say, I think there is a, a yeah. built, there's a built-in, what do you call it, data protection data. In, in in the in the quantum field. And if it's not relevant, you won't be uh if it's not relevant or not appropriate, you won't be given access. And I think that's very important. But yes, yes to everything else, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's meaningful questions, I mean, I suppose. Yes, I mean, we, we have to be mindful about what information we are seeking and why and what our motivation is behind it. And and I think as you go on, the um, the responsibility makes it of, of dowsing and accessing wisdom makes itself known and you grow in that responsibility and you grow in that wisdom because it's pretty heady being given all that information it's being it's pretty heady stuff realizing literally at your fingertips you you have this um ability i'm not going to say power but ability to access truth yes and that but that does come with with it needs to come with wisdom and it comes with a need to be responsible with it it's it's that saying, isn't it? With ultimate power comes, you know, responsibility. Yes. But like I said, but it is. But we're, you know, when we're, but when we're focused on asking meaningful questions about our own life, you know, let's say we have career choices to make, or we're thinking, like, say, about moving house or something, that we can find out what is the best option for us in the long term or in the short term, or to meet, like, say, to meet our long term goals. We don't have to make choices based on guesswork or pulling a vague oracle card, we can get a, a definite yes or no answer to what's the best course of action when we ask a carefully framed, carefully framed, unambiguous and concise question. I have a series of questions to break a topic down so we can get to that truth because it is only the truth that sets us free, isn't it? If we try to skirt around it, we end up taking the long way around and that that thing that we needed to face just keeps coming back and back and get back again, more virulent until we actually face it. And I think that's the, for me, one of the really empowering things about being able to douse is that it makes a step up in a way. Absolutely. I wouldn't, I would again add a, a caveat to that because <laughs> life as we know, isn't black and white mm. and there are many shades of gray. And we're actually not limited to just, just a yes and no. I mean, I don't know about you. I, I use dowsing rod, by the way, not a pendulum. But my rods will move in with various um, levels of, of force or speed um, as to how um, potent a yes is or how potent um, yeah. a, a no is. But also what I like to teach is so you can get that shade of gray so you can get more background and more more context is is actually um asking on a scale of one to ten on a scale of one to ten how much is it in my best interest yeah in principle anyway to move house um what is it two out of ten or ten out of ten or three out of ten which gives us more of an idea but it might be nine out of ten and there's just something qualifying that answer and then you can go on to find out why but but i i i like to say i'd like to teach that it's not just a pure yes and no because life isn't just a pure yes and no 
yeah um, I, t I teach very much the same that you have yeah. to break things down it's yeah to is it in my best interest to move how sort of like I say to what extent where would be appropriate for me to move at what time of year would be appropriate for me to move there's so we brought let's say we break the issue down don't we with these different questions of and qualifying our answer to find out sort of like say how much how often so that we we can paint this picture this broad scope of what we're letting ourselves in for if we if we take that route and i think that's i say it's really important because there is no black and white there are there's nuance and gray and you know and we're and we're only ever given the information almost that we can handle aren't we because things unfold as we grow so we can only receive what we're ready to receive at that particular point in time i do use this method in dress shops by the way um on a scale of one to ten how much is it in my best interest to buy this dress <laughs> <laughs> I use it to go shopping as well. You know, will will they have something that I like in that shop? Will it be in my budget? Will it be in my size? Will it be available to buy off the peg today? You know, and all those kind of it cuts down so much time. Oh yes, how much is it in my best interest to read this book or watch this film? Yeah, etc. Yeah. Et Everything we can use. I mean, you know, it's it's such a you know, and then of course I'd say our mental health, our physical health, our emotional health, which I know is is a huge passion of yours because um, you help people, don't you, with their their actual health and um, you know to get over the things that are do you want to you know that are holding them back from full health and full it's really embodiment of who we are do you want to talk obviously not case studies but you want to talk a little bit about how that works because it's um sure so so when I was I just backtrack a little bit when I was running uh, uh, the um, geopathic stress consultancy or environmental energies and subtle energies as well we did loads of subtle energies and entities um when I was doing that um I'd always phone the client a week or two weeks after how are you how do you feel now have the symptoms gone and some clients would say um oh, I feel amazing I've had the best night's sleep you know for two weeks now and or they'd say well I think I feel better and others would say, nope, don't feel better at all. And 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 of course, my I've got a very strong Capricorn moon. I'm, I'm quite, quite anal about these things, actually. And and I wanted some structure in that. I wanted um, some analytics in that. Mm -hmm. And so I started to take health readings for clients to see how much they'd improved since I since we'd done the visit. And in fact, so, it, I used to take an overall health reading. I used to take um, an immune system and absorption of nutrients because I knew things like geopathic stress and electromagnetic pollution, mm -hmm. particularly um, compromise the absorption of nutrients in the body. And, and also, of course, as we all know, as dowsers, um, overnight, the body doesn't do its housework. It's, it's okay. housekeeping, not housework. It's housekeeping when you are in a compromised environment. Mm -hmm. So um, this is where all the health readings came in. You know, and absolutely, in fact, my health readings confirm what clients were saying. So some didn't get better and some didn't and some got a bit better. So I thought, well, what's, what is compromising their health if it's not the home, if it's not the office, it's not the environment, it's not subtle energies, what actually is compromising their health. And this was the sort of the foundation of what I do, which is co finding causative factors. And a doctor that I met who I worked with called it causative diagnosis. So I was diagnosing not health conditions, but the underlying mm. causative contributory and trigger factors and, and people say, well, what do you look at? I don't look at anything in particular. I look at everything and and I have a very structured, there we go again, um, way of working through this in order to identify causative factors. Um, and now um, I've got clients in, in 30 countries and um, I've been doing it for 20, 20, over 20 years, can't believe it, 20 years plus. Um, and I, I do mostly online, as most of us do these days. But 
Um, I do also do home visits and as well. And I work with doctors, um, dentists, which I love doing. Um, and uh, I'm serious about that because I can see what's in, in the jaw and what I can tell exactly what's going in the jaw without any invasive surgery. Um, and, and directly with private clients as well. And it turns out that my speciality really, although I look at all conditions, is cancer. And of course, that's incredibly topical at the moment with the huge increase of cancer. So I'm able to tell people exactly what caused their cancer. And the benefit of that is that they can take their recipe, if you like, of causative contributory and trigger factors, and they can un address the underlying symptom, the underlying causes, the underlying, rather than just managing symptoms with drugs. And they can address those underlying factors and then give the body the chance for it to heal itself. Yeah, I totally get what you're saying. And I, I used to work, I'd say, I think you, you started in geopathic stress and then moved into health. And I I started in health and angiopathic stress and sort of stayed in the subtle energy, earth energy realm. But you, you're absolutely right. You know, you, you need you can't really do one without the other because we're intimately linked with the energies in our environment as well as our own life experience. I always describe them as sort of nested energy ecologies like Russian dolls. We exist in so many different nested mm -hmm. energy ecologies. There's, a, there's our, you know, our family, uh, our, our own body, there's our neighborhood, there's our environment. There's all these sort of different things. And, you know, and, and, and when something has gone astray in our lives you know we, like I say like doctors will often treat the symptoms but we really need to get down don't we to that root cause whether it was trauma in childhood or a childhood inoculation or some past life something but there's some nugget isn't there that we have to get to that nugget for real healing to occur because otherwise it's it's like it's like something that's still festering away and if you treat those symptoms it'll it'll burst out in another way i always think something else will go astray even if you get the get the sort of some symptoms down so yeah i mean we have to tackle people holistically don't we we have to look at the holistic environment that people are operating in to get them fully well because like you're working in geopathic stress let's say and, and house healing and business healing you can know that there's a limit to that there's that boundary and then the problems exist outside of that boundary so yeah I think I think it's and, and often it's not the environment they mm. just they just believe it's the environment but once we've got the the body detoxed and the nutrition right and all their mental emotional psychological spiritual issues um back to balance um they get the body goes back to balance they go back to balance and they reflect that into their environment mm. as a mirror reflection their yeah. health yeah. yeah i found that working in houses that i say if people move into somewhere that has got disturbed energy what it's actually normally is it's reflecting an imbalance in them so mm -hmm. if the energy in their environment has got like poor boundaries people infringe on their property boundaries you'll often find that that person has their own personal poor boundaries yes. so, that, so that they mirror each other. And what the, almost the property is doing is holding a mirror up to say, you need to deal with that internally. Yes. You need to deal with your sense of self-worth. You need to deal with your self-respect. That's what the property is actually trying to tell you. So I think in many respects, I go into people's health through their environment to say your environment is holding things up to you and you need to look at them to fully in, you know claim your health claim your sort of innate soul power claim your sovereignty over your life if it's saying you've got poor boundaries if it's saying there's a lack of flow there's a lack of something it's trying to tell you something and you need to listen because the universe is actually sending you a message it's trying to help you it's just that you know our, our biggest lessons are usually our biggest challenges aren't they with everything we want comes through that growth spurt and those growth phases are uncomfortable. Absolutely. Um, a person who has discordant energy um, will often pick a house with discordant energy. So they're really just um, uh, continuing or prolonging the issue. Um, and, and in fact, I spoke to two clients this, uh, this week who'd worked with um, uh, somebody who 
rebalances homes and clears homes. And uh, they said, and, and in fact, I, I had I had dinner with them, which actually was an incredibly uncomfortable experience. I I hadn't worked with them. And um, I had ended up with a pounding headache and feeling very uncomfortable and very, very flat. And so I, I called the person who'd done all the work on the house and I said, it's not good. This is what I felt. And they said immediately, they said, no, because I gave them the inner work to do and they haven't done the inner work. And as long as you don't do the inner work, whether you're supported in that or you're doing it yourself, um, it, you, it will continue to reflect back, mirror reflection into the home. Yes. So they need to do their, their, their inner work. They do need to do their inner work. And I think that's one of the things that I like teaching people earth energy work for is we sort of go through the whole spectrum of we look at the home and what it's presenting to them. We look at healing their environment, but also self-healing because through the act of healing their environment, they have to tackle the issues with themselves. And then finally, I take them onto this sort of level of um, creating sacred space energy structures so that they can actually tune in to their higher self so they can get this information that they need about who they are and what they came here to become, what they came here to embody, what their soul values are, so that they've got this then space that they can go into. Because I think in the past, I, I make the huge assumption that we kind of had that on a societal level because we had sacred space in the landscape. And I think we recognised that we needed an earth energy basis that sort of supported all life, all growth, all harmony, whether that be crop growth and harvest or our own growth and harvest, and that we needed secular spaces where we lived and worked and they were fully supported. And we needed sacred space where we could tap into this universal consciousness to say, this is in our best interest. This is how we're going to support ourselves um, in, a, in a way that's in harmony with all these universal forces. And unfortunately, we don't do that on a societal level anymore. Do we? We're not going to go and erect a modern day Stonehenge or a new Avebury. So the only way we've really got a tapping into that is in our own spaces and our own homes to create this miniature sacred space because those frequencies of that energy from what I've learned is a way of, bridging the discrepancy between our consciousness and our physical form which is the channel for that consciousness which can only take so much and these much bigger higher consciousnesses you know if you wanted to talk to the planet venus for instance that's a big consciousness and i'm only a small conduit and sacred space is a way of bridging that discrepancy so that we can communicate in harmony um that's how i feel about it, and that's how i work and it seems to work okay so I think I think I, I hope there's method merit in that method. And there seems to be through my work. So, um, okay. yeah, I think we we need to work. As I say, you're right. We absolutely need to work on ourselves. And we all, um, and space is very much a, a part of that that picture. So George Applegate used to say, uh, George Applegate, the water dowser, used to say um, the only thing that counts with dowsing is results. So if if you're getting the results that's all that counts you don't have to prove it to anyone else and you know really I suppose in the last 20 30 years that's what I've been doing is building up um, a portfolio of results and that's the most important thing when people come to you because you really can't first of all you've got most of uh normal normal society against you saying it's a load of rubbish um but secondly uh it's a big leap of faith for some people for something that is you, you cannot see or feel or it's not tangible although having a pair of dowsing rods and a pendulum does help yeah it gives them it gives them some some frame of reference as a pin their attention on having dowsing rods. I think for me, that's partly why I like the earth energy stuff is I, I kind of went into the, the science of it as well. You know, how electromagnetic fields affect the body, how mm -hmm. the build of a piezoelectricity in rocks affects uh, things like pineal gland and all those kind of things. So that you can say on an esoteric spiritual level, this is the terminology, but actually on a scientific level, we can see that this is what is happening. We can see that we can understand how plasma works in the magnetosphere, for instance, and how our body responds to that. Yes. So I think, I think having that too is, is quite important, but yeah, having results 
And I think, you know, seeing the people that you work with get those results and for them to be able to go out and say to other people, this actually works. You might not, it's not tangible, but it does work. Um, I think that's the, that's that's almost like the constant battle, isn't it? When we're working in with intangible things. I know. You're, you're almost selling the intangible to people. It's quite hard. It's it's like, oh, well, well has your work been confirmed by with medical testing? Well, yes, actually, because they'll take my results of like like um what we call viruses, or they take um my the list of toxins I've identified in the body. And and one woman one woman went and had a hair test. <laughs> and she I think she really she couldn't quite believe that I had identified exactly what then she then went to have um identified in the hair test and there it all was and at the top of the list mercury, you know, mercury poisoning. But yeah, yeah, my work's been confirmed many times with medical testing. And of course that gives people uh, a sense of security that you know it is real and it is happening but I tell you what with um with people are doing dowsing with with dowsers themselves and with people like clients who are questioning it I I, I rarely say go and read this dowsing book or that dowsing book because there is there's a lot of disparate information in in dowsing books with the best will in the world mm -hmm. um and um, what the, the direction I point them in is uh, Lynn McTaggart's book, The Field. Yes. Because once people have read The Field, um, which for those who haven't read it, is a book about um, the, the quantum field and um, from a scientific perspective, but written brilliantly by a non-scientist, by a, 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 a very, very good journalist, Lynn. Um, explaining how science and the quantum field and consciousness all works and once you've read that and once you've understood what you're tapping into it gives such a, a, a huge confidence um, it, for, um particularly for, for dowsers because they can then visualize that there is a field there is an information field it is all connected it isn't connected through entanglement it is there um and that's what we're tapping into and i i often when i'm teaching i see that shift of mm -hmm. you know, just dowsing on some um, very nebulous uh, sort of energy to then being able to visualize the quantum field um, or the Akashic field, the A field, they can understand that. And that gives this new, A, this new confidence, but some sort of structure mm. uh, for them to, to tap into. Brilliant. And I uh, just one other thing I'd like to caution is, um, again, there are a lot of dowsers that go out to people's homes who um they may quite accurately pick up what's there, but then wave their rods around, do a bit of intent and say, no, it's all done now. And, and they leave. And then two weeks or two months later, it all comes back again, because unlike you and some others, they haven't included the client in that process mm -hmm. to find out what's discordant within the client and what is causing that mirror reflection. Yeah, you have to look at that. And with the best will in the world, her intent works with some things, but there are certain fields and forces, aren't there? We, we do may need to put something in place to earth energy down. You know, there, there are times when energy rises from geological features, for instance. The best will in the world, your intent is not going to stop energy rising from a geological fault line, for instance. You know, it's there are other things that we need to take into account, I think, sometimes as well. And why did the client um, pick that particular place yeah, to live? Yeah, why did they choose to live near a fault line? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, it, and it doesn't mean that energy is not going to continue to rise either. The interesting thing is that energy that they found problematic, once, like you say, once they deal with their issue, that energy will rise and then it's no longer a problem for them because it just, it doesn't crash because there's no need for it to crash anymore. It's just passes through. So I think there's a lot of energy that people will say actually, you know, are always 100 percent problematic that I would argue actually they're not. They're problematic for that person because of where they are. 
Like, and, you know, there will be certain people that will be borrowed by certain frequencies of Wi-Fi and certain people that won't. I mean, we won't get into 5G or anything now. That's not a conversation for today. But there are, there are you know, there are some frequencies that will say, well, you know, you can never live over running water, for instance. No, that person can't live over running water at this time. Many people, it will not bother them at all. You know, and there, there are certain, it's very, it, you're in a relationship with place. Yes. And you have to look at that relationship. It's not that that place is bad and it's bad for everybody. You know, it's it's what is that place, as I say, it always comes back to what is that place trying to tell you? What are the lessons and challenges that it has for you at this stage of your journey? Because it's calling you to look at that growth that you need to occur, needs to occur within yourself. It's the same principle as Ho'oponopono, mm -hmm. because when you're doing Ho'oponopono, uh, uh, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I love you. Thank you. You're saying that to your higher self and you're clearing, clearing your body, clearing your your, your um, body's uh, energy field. You're clearing, clearing, clearing. And so any discordant energy out there um, isn't uh, going to impact you because it's, oh. it's a different frequency. So it's just going to bounce off. Yeah, so yeah exactly the same principle yeah yes it's all to do with frequencies it frequency vibration our own vibration i'd say if you get two vibe frequencies the same they're going to clash if you get one at a different right then it's it's just it, it it passes by so yeah i think the other thing i think yeah i think one other thing that i think we touched on this a little bit earlier on one of the things that i find a little bit concerning is the amount of misinformation, even with the best will and intention there is there about dowsing. Um, you know, I, I do find it a little bit frustrating at times that the, the things that people say that they believe dowsing is doing or that there is quite a degree, it's kind of, kind of no polite way of putting it, is that there's such a lot of misinformation about dowsing online particularly that I do find quite concerning in a way because it is leading people to a the wrong conclusions or to believe that they're dowsing when actually they're not dowsing you know holding a pendulum it going around in circles for instance you know it's not dowsing you're just holding a pendulum for instance uh in that respect in that you're not exploring a topic or a question or a I don't know whether there's a way of combating that I'm not sure yet it's just something I think the only thing we can do as dowsers, particularly when we're professionalists, is to, to project it in as professional a way as possible and to explain it, as you say, as succinctly as possible. Um, but is it, I don't know, I'll put you on the spot, is it concerning? But is that is that something that you found as well in your, um, over the years, that there's quite a lot of, I don't know, it's almost like they build it up with this edge, this mystique and this mystery, isn't it? <laughs> that spills about dowsing that I find a little bit frustrating. I'd say it's not done intentionally to malign. I think it's just a lack of understanding, really, of how dowsing actually works and say that we're back to the quantum fields again, that people have this sort of vague notion that we're working with, ooh, energy. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, but what energy? <laughs> to do what? To achieve what outcome, you know? In a in a in a in a dowsing, say I I, I used to do a lot of uh, weekend dowsing courses, and in a dowsing uh, workshop, first thing on a on a Saturday morning, and they'll all pick up their pendulums or their rods, and they'll be moving and swinging all over the place and whizzing, and mm -hmm. oh, what does this mean? What does this mean? <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> what, yeah. You, you have to, because it's not, as we know, it's not the dowsing tool that has the magical powers. It's actually the, the, the real dowsing instrument is your body. Yeah. Because, and we know this because most of us can douse without any any tool uh, yeah. in, in, in either in your hand. I mean, dowsing rods or, or pendulums, but... I mean, you can douse with any part of your body because it's your body that is, that is connecting to the consciousness field. It's your body. And, you you know, I know people who, well, I, I use I use my arm. I don't know, as a as a pendulum, you know, in a restaurant or in a supermarket or whatever um, to get answers, you know, whatever's on the menu. 
um, people use their hands, their, their, their fingers, kinesiologists often use their fingers. Um, people use their whole body. Some people falling forward or falling back to get a yes or no. You can even use your um, your your tongue, whether it goes up or down on your mouth when you ask a question, or even your, I love the eye, the eye one. I think it's, um, show me a yes. Okay, show me a no. So no is one blink and, and a yes is two blinks. So you can sit in a situation where um, outwardly dowsing would not be appropriate, but but dowsing with your blinks, unless you're on a date, of course, and your partner would think that you're fluttering your eyelashes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I do, think... <laughs> so it's, it's really important that people understand that this the yes. body is the instrument and the various tools don't have any necessarily any imbued powers, but they're just an extension through yeah. micro muscular movements um, uh, to show an outward outward result. But it's the body, and um, which which brings up something else. When you're a dowser, you have to look after your instrument and your body because mm -hmm. any blockages in the body, any imbalances in the body will come out through your dowsing, yeah. your dowsing tool. And and I, I, I've been there and done it on the T-shirt. There was, you know, when I first started, I had um, an imbalance in, in male, female in my body. And in fact, one rod my two rods, one rod just simply wouldn't move. The other rod would move all over the place and around, very responsive, but this rod wouldn't until I got the balance right in my body. So this has to be healthy. This has to be in balance. Yeah. Uh, it's like it's like you're an athlete, aren't you? And the and the and the you know the the dowsing tool is your, you know, it's your discus or your pendulum, you know, it's your javelin, but you can't utilize that correctly, as you say, without without the body being right. But yeah, I mean, I'm the same. I, I will douse around supermarkets. I'll use the sticky finger method or I just, for me, I've only even got to go near a product and I can feel whether I should be eating it, consuming uh, it or even anywhere near it. It's like, no, nope. <laughs> you know, even things like, you know, pet food, you know, I can always tell when, oh no, can't give that to the cat. You know, I can, I can feel it. And if ever I've gone against it, it's interesting. I thought, oh, perhaps I'm just being silly, which I don't know. But I used to. There would be the cat biscuits that the cat would just not touch, and I was like, "That's oh, absolutely right," you know. And if, and if my cats agree with me, then I must be right. <laughs> cats are good like that. Dogs forget it; they'll eat anything. Yeah. But the cats will instinctively not eat or go near anything that yeah. is in their best interest. Yeah, yeah. That's not to say you should use your cat as your food tester, by the way, for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll try it with the cat first. <laughs> I understand that cats won't eat microwave food. No, they won't. No, they don't like the microwave on even in the kitchen. I mean, I don't. Well, I don't have one anymore. But you know, when when I've been around them, you can see them when it's on, <laughs> taking a wider berth as possible. So yeah, they're interesting. Animals know, don't they? Animals know. <laughs> you know, and they'll. It's interesting, like you know, coming from a farming family, it's what farm animals will tell you about earth energy as well. You know, what the energy in the landscape's doing. Animals are great indicators of those yes, things. Yes, aren't they? Just yeah. Yeah. like horses um, in a stable when they're. Um... They're, they're cooped into a stable and they'll kick the door down if they've got a geopathic stress line going through yeah, them. Yeah, I used to work with a lot of horses. I used to work uh, with equine yards and racing stables, um, yeah. sorting out the geopathic stress in their environment so that their horses felt safe and secure. And, um, and they read this energy a lot. I worked with a blind horse, completely blind, and she wouldn't go anywhere without a, a companion horse because there was such a lot of geopathic stress in the area. And when I went in and worked on these, um, this considerable 2,000 acre estate for these horses, she then would come out, she could read the energy. She moved around entirely independently without a companion horse. She knew exactly where she was going. I could put myself in her head and she could see this energetic landscape. But when wow. it was stressed, she couldn't see it. So it's like to, she had to have to take her shoes off and everything. No, she needs her feet. She needs her feet. She needs to feel it, get the shoes off. And she had a completely different, like 3D energetic representation of the landscape that she was walking through. Absolutely incredible. So they're so in tune with their environment on many levels, but sheep and cattle are exactly the same. All animals are the same. So it's really interesting. So, um, yeah. So 
Yeah, I hope people can see what an amazing opportunity it is to learn to dowsing and how with, um, you know, with careful practice, it is a way actually of transforming your life. I think it's a, a wonderful tool. So if anybody wants to get in touch with you, reach out to you, um, buy your book, how can they do that? Um, well, it's on, first, it, the book's on Amazon. It's on, uh, it's um on Amazon all around the world it's in, it's, it's selling on five continents and um and it's in six languages but failing that um there's a link through my 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 website there is a book page on my website so um uh and the work also is is all outlined on my website as well which is called causativediagnosis.com and i will put the link the link is below folks in the in the text if you want to check out Elizabeth's work. Mm. So thank you so much for joining me today. It's been lovely to talk to you. And I hope um, maybe we'll talk again. If people have enjoyed this conversation, let us know if you want to hear from Elizabeth again. And um, thank you very much. It's been lovely to talk to you. Been fantastic. And thank you. And yes, delighted to help anyone uh, make those first steps on the road to being a dowser. Certainly transform my life. Thank you very much.